So in the last video, we made the argument that in a competitive labor market, employers can't maintain discriminatory wage differences over the long run. And the reason is essentially that if it's possible for less prejudiced employers to enter the labor market to, to start new firms, then competitive pressures are going to drive anyone out of business who has costs above the lowest possible cost of doing business. And because employer prejudice leads employers to have higher labor costs, it's not possible for prejudiced employers to stay in the market. So that leads to the question, what if it's not employers who are prejudiced? What if there's other members of the, of the firm or other agents in an economy who potentially have prejudices against non-white employees? So to start with, let's think about the situation where some employees are prejudiced, right? So instead of employer prejudice, let's think about employee prejudice. And to begin with, I want to think about a very, very simple version of this. So we could imagine that in the real world, you have a variety of different opinions held by white and non-white employees about race. In this world, I'm going to say that we have a couple things. We have all white employees are prejudiced to the exact same degree. Specifically, they have some level of distaste D for working at a firm that employs any non-white employees. And third, that non-white employees are completely unprejudiced. That is, they're indifferent between working with white employees and working with non-white employees. And I should say, these are much stronger assumptions than we're going to need to make the, the argument that's going to come from this. And in fact, I'm going to have you guys work through a version of this with more, um, with looser assumptions in your problem set. But in this circumstance, let's think about what's going to happen in a competitive market. So to begin with, let's think about the problem facing a white employee who's deciding whether to work at an integrated firm or a segregated firm. That is a whites only firm or a firm that has some white and some black employees. about the white workers problem. So if you're a white worker and you're considering whether to work at an integrated firm or a segregated firm and you're prejudiced against non-white employee, non-white co-workers, you're only going to be willing to work at the integrated firm if the wage that you receive at that integrated firm is sufficiently high to overcome your prejudice. In other words, you'll only work at the integrated firm If your wage as a white worker of working at in an integrated firm, so WWI, I know this notation is getting a little awful, um, is going to be greater than or equal to, I'll do it, sorry, WWI minus D, right, because you're facing a distaste for working with non-white co-workers, is greater than or equal to WWW. In other words, your wage as a white worker of working with only white workers. In other words, we're going to need to have an integrated wage that's greater than the segregated wage by an amount D. This makes sense? So if this isn't true, it's just not going to be in the white workers' interest, given their level of prejudice, to work with non-white co-workers. 
And of course, because non-white coworkers, because non-white workers are not prejudiced, we're not going to think about the dynamics of their decision because they're indifferent between working at a, at a firm that has white coworkers or not. So now that we've thought about that, let's consider the decision of the firm, right? So if you're a firm that employs white employees and black employees, and you don't care at all about which kinds of employees you're working, you're employing, what has to be true of wages? So if you're a firm who could employ white employees, could employ black employees, and they're exactly as productive, right? So your profits for white labor and black labor, right, are just going to equal your revenue minus your costs, which is going to be the white wage times white labor, black wage times black labor. Well, we know that white and black employees are equally productive, so you're only going to hire both white and black employees if the wage you pay white workers is exactly the same as the wage you'd pay black workers, right? In other words, if the wage that you pay a white worker in an integrated firm has to equal the wage that you pay a black worker. But if this were true, from here, we would know that the wage you would pay a white worker at a segregated firm would have to be less than the wage you pay a black worker, right? So we'd say... Right? A white worker at a segregated firm is willing to, to earn less than a white worker at an integrated firm, which we said would have to be equal to the wage of a black worker in an integrated firm. And if this was true, then a profit-maximizing employer who doesn't actually care about the race of their employees would only hire white workers. Right? So in order for us to be at a market equilibrium, given that employers don't care if they're going to hire white workers or black workers, it has to be the case that the wage of white workers equals the wage of black workers, and that's going to mean that it has to be the case that no workplace is integrated. So what we're going to end up with only segregated workplaces and a white wage that is equal to the black wage, or the non-white wage. So in other words, this is a model that is going to be able to generate segregation in the workplace. It's not going to be able to generate any sort of wage gap between minority and non-minority workers. Okay, so we've said that if employers are prejudiced, it can lead to wage gaps in the short run, but over the long run, competitive forces should drive prejudiced employers out of the marketplace. And if employees are prejudiced, it can lead to segregation, but it shouldn't lead to wage gaps. So there's one last possibility I want to think about, which is what if it's customers who are prejudiced? In other words, let's imagine a situation where some fraction of customers, let's say some white patrons of restaurants, have a preference to be served by white servers rather than being served by black or other minority servers. Could that generate persistent differences in wages between my, white and minority workers? Well, the important thing to note here is that from the perspective of the firm, if a customer is willing to pay more for a meal served by a white worker than for a meal served by a black worker, from the firm's perspective, the white worker is more productive in that job than a black worker. In other words, that firm is going to be more profitable by hiring a white worker for, for a certain wage than they are by hiring a black worker. And as a customer, the customer isn't going to face any competitive pressures to change their perspective. They might have to pay more for meals because of their prejudice, but that's not something that can drive them out of the restaurant market. So as a result, what we're going to conclude is that if you're a firm that, faces, that has prejudiced customers, and those prejudiced customers have a preference for one type of worker over another, let's say white workers over non-white workers, then your profit maximizing choice is going to be if, it, if it's the case that wages are the same for white versus non-white workers, you're going to hire white workers. So is that going to generate persistent differences in wages by race? 
Well, it really depends on how many jobs have this sort of customer discrimination. So we can think about this as effectively the same as the way we thought about employer discrimination. In other words, we can make a graph where we have some level of discrimination D and we have our jobs ranked from the least prejudiced to the most prejudiced. But in this case, instead of ranking this on the basis of the prejudices of the employers themselves, we're going to be ranking on the basis of the prejudices of the customers patronizing these establishments. Or we can think about it as the level of exposure to prejudiced customers in different jobs. So we might imagine that we have lots and lots of jobs where there's no exposure to customers at all, or customers are totally unprejudiced. And then there's going to be some set of jobs with varying degrees of exposure to prejudiced customers, right? So we could essentially say jobs that have no exposure I'll call not customer facing aren't going to be willing to pay anything more for a white employee than for a black employee and customers that and and jobs that are customer facing will be willing to pay some premium to get white workers and that premium is going to depend on how prejudiced their customers are. So whether we're going to end up with a gap between white and black wages is going to depend on how many black workers there are relative to how many jobs are customer facing and face prejudiced customers. So if the fraction of the workforce that was non-white was say here, then just like in an employer discrimination model, we would say that the black-white wage gap or the, the white non-white wage gap would be just given by the level of discrimination for the marginal employer. So we would basically say that the wage of white workers minus the wage of non-white workers would equal zero because that's the level of discrimination. On the other hand, if we had more prejudiced employers or more job I'm sorry, more jobs that faced prejudiced customers. So let's say instead we had something like this and our P star was here. Right? So in this case, we're going to have that the marginal employer is going to face prejudiced customers. Then we would have a black-white wage gap that would be set equal to the essentially the difference in productivity between white and black um, or white and non-white employee, employees in this customer facing job. So another thing to ask here, when are we going to have fully segregated workplaces and when won't we? Well in this case where the black-white wage gap is zero, all of the jobs that are customer facing and face prejudiced customers are going to be white only. Because in all of these jobs, from the perspective of the employer, white workers are going to be more productive than non-white workers. Despite the fact, again, I want to emphasize that there's no actual differences between white and black workers in this model, right? But because of customer preferences, white employers are more productive than black employers, employees in this model. So these firms are only going to hire white workers. All of these firms are going to be integrated. Why are they integrated? Because there's going to be some white employees who are not working in these all white jobs and firms and workers in this broad area of non consumer facing jobs are indifferent to the race of employees. In this model, all of these jobs are going to only hire white workers. Because the difference in productivity, again generated by, by customer prejudice, is going to be larger than the wage gap in these jobs. And all of these jobs are going to be non-white only. Because in all of these jobs, 
the difference in white and non-white productivity, again driven by customer preference, is going to be smaller than the wage gap. So for all of these firms, it'll be more profitable to hire non-white workers at a lower wage than to hire white workers at a higher wage. So in this model, if you have enough customer-facing jobs and you have enough prejudice on the, on the part of customers, you can get persistent wage gaps between white and non-white employees, and you can get strict segregation between white and non-white employees. But if you don't have enough prejudiced customers to generate that, you're going to end up with some jobs that are only occupied by white workers, but you're not going to end up with persistent wage gaps. Okay, so to sum up what we've learned, to sum up Becker's models, what Becker is going to argue is that in a competitive labor market, the only source of persistent wage gaps between um, that are not generated by differences in actual worker productivity have to come from customers. And the reason for that is essentially that competitive markets are a machine that drive firms towards profit maximization. And as a result of that, it's not possible for firms to ever engage in any market activities in any organization of work that doesn't maximize profits. So the reason that employer preferences aren't able to generate persistent differences in wages is because employers are actually powerless in a competitive labor market. Their only choices are to operate their business in a profit maximizing fashion or to go out of business eventually. And so as a result, what Becker says is, if we want to understand why you have persistent differences in wages by race or persistent labor market segregation, instead of looking at employers, we should either, well, we should look at two things. One is barriers to competition that allow prejudiced employers to stay in business. So as an example, during the time that Becker was writing these models, the banking sector um, mostly excluded Jewish workers with a, with a handful of exceptions like places like Goldman Sachs. And so, you know, he and then Milton Friedman talked about that using these models. Um, so you either have a lack of discrimination, I mean, I'm sorry, a lack of competition, or you can have persistent wage dif differences driven by prejudices among customers. So what we're going to talk about next time is some complications to this story. Sets of models where instead of taking prejudices as a given and seeing whether market forces are able to eliminate the discriminatory effects of prejudices, we're instead going to think about discrimination as coming out of basically a game theory equilibrium. The argument is going to be very different. Instead of making an argument that says that prejudice can be maintained without resulting in discrimination under certain circumstances, we're going to make an argument that discrimination can be maintained without any underlying prejudice. Okay, thank you so much for sticking with me. Hope you're having a wonderful day, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about this via blue jeans.